a little bit about my background and why you might want to pay attention. I spent 26 years as a senior executive Fortune 500 company. I ran divisions for uh, this company. I had as many as 2,500 people I was responsible for across the world. And I loved what I did. I genuinely loved what I did. I got to work with a lot of really great people. I enjoyed building businesses. I built, enjoyed um, uh, uh, fixing businesses within the company. And yet, in the midst of all that, I had a very strong desire for lifestyle freedom. I traveled extensively, which I enjoyed, but I always was aware that I wanted to do something that gave me the complete freedom to live wherever I wanted to, do whatever I wanted to, travel wherever I wanted to, stay for as long as I wanted to, and basically not be limited by location. So I started trading, and I've been trading for about 30 years. I traded for 20 years as a hobby while I was still working. And as I started to understand more and more about trading, I realized that this was probably the best job or career or income generating opportunity that was available. And I started to get very serious about learning how to make this be a, um, a good component of my future. Uh, so I've been teaching now for 10 years. Uh, when I left my job, I uh, had a lot of questions from people in my uh, work network, and my social network, and said, geez, you know, you're a little young to be retiring. Uh, in the technical sense, what are you going to do? And I told them what I have been doing. Had a lot of questions from people about how they could participate also. And one thing led to another, and that's why I ended up founding Options Moneymaker in 2009. We focus now on teaching traders the art of trading. We are not a education service that will teach you every single nuance of every single type of option strategy out there. There are just so many out there and there's so many great strategies but what we've really done is we've adopted a philosophy of trying to keep things as simple as possible so that anybody can take advantage of trading and the type of financial rewards that it can bring. I host a live trading room every day, so everything that I teach is based on uh, active, real-time trading. Uh, and in that live trading room, I am coaching uh, throughout the day. So we have uh, subscribers to services that um, uh, benefit from uh, alerts that we send out from the live trading room, and then we have other people who actually uh, sign up to participate in our live trading room. And ultimately, I did achieve the goal that I had, which was enjoying lifestyle freedom. I, uh, you know, have the uh, very good fortune of living at the beach, uh, see the ocean every day, and um, you know, I'm a I'm an avid motorcyclist, and so live right off of Highway One in California, and get to enjoy. Uh, all the beauty that uh, comes with that. So anyway, I'd like to share with you a little bit about how I think you might be able to obtain the same type of lifestyle freedom if that is something that you desire. Now, who's going to benefit from today's presentation? Uh, beginning traders who might be looking for a way to get started. You might have just learned the basics of options. You might have just learned what an option is, what a call, what a put are. You might have just learned about uh, expirations and strike prices. Those are all very, very basic characteristics of options. Uh, they're easy to uh, get that information from so many sources. Uh, but basically, if you are looking then for a way to get started, now how do I go use this information to start trading, then I would suggest you pay attention today and I'm going to help you see a way that you could get involved and get started with a little bit of adult supervision, a little hand-holding by us. Experienced traders, if you're seeking greater levels of success, perhaps you trade a lot, but you'd like to simplify your trading. Things have gotten a little out of hand. Things are a little complicated. You're never really confident with what you're doing. Pay attention. I'm going to help you understand how you could simplify. The type of trading that I'm going to share with you today isn't for everybody. And I don't want to present it that way, but I do believe that if you're looking for a way to have a fairly simple approach to trading and filter out all of the uh, very complex, sophisticated um, things that exist in the trading universe, then this might be uh, the right uh, path for you. If you're committed to learning a lifelong skill, um, I think the trading is one of the best things you can learn because knowledge can never be taken away from you. 
Uh, a job can be taken away from you unexpectedly. A business can somehow be taken away from you unexpectedly. But if you always have knowledge and you have enough capital to get started with, you will always have the ability to generate some type of an income. And then, of course, traders who are seeking a simple way to trade and earn. Uh, we teach uh, a lot about minimizing fear, just kind of take a non-emotional approach to trading. Uh, we're very uh, quiet about our trading. We're very calm about our trading. Uh, we just are thoughtful about what the next step is, what do we need to do based on what the market has told us. We essentially want what the market wants, and we just follow along with the market, and we take advantage of the opportunities that are presented to us. So if you'd like to learn how to minimize fear and grow a bigger account, once again, this is a way for you to do that. So I'm going to be talking about credit spreads today because credit spreads are one of the most widely understood, commonly understood strategies uh, available to options traders. Credit spreads are a very simple directional strategy. Okay? The problem is it's simple, but a lot of traders fail trading credit spreads, and I really don't believe that is necessary. A lot of traders will fail because they use improper strikes. They, they just don't understand how to properly select their strikes. They might have read a book, they might have picked up some little bit of information, and they think that they know how to trade, and they might trade successfully for a few trades, and then they tend to give it all back to the market. They donate it back to the market. Insufficient time built into the position. When weekly expirations on options started to become very uh, common, uh, and available to us uh, a few years ago, a lot of people started trading the weeklies, which meant that they traded an expiration period that was a weekly, and it was also very close to today, meaning they were trading the next week expiration. There, there are strategies that that can be successful with, but that's not a way to build peace of mind and a lack of anxiety into your trading. So we leverage uh, weeklies, but we don't necessarily trade the next week expiration. And I'm going to show you some examples of that and show you how we structure our trades here in just a few minutes. One of the reasons people fail also is they have a relatively naive assessment of risk. Uh, they don't really understand the level of risk they have on. They only look at a numerical risk. They look at the risk to reward ratio and they judge the um, viability of a position based on risk reward as opposed to a true risk assessment and I'm going to show you what I mean by that. A true risk assessment means you have to understand what the uh, likelihood is that your trade is going to work out and there are some very very simple basic factors you can use to make that assessment. It doesn't have to be complicated. And then uh, no adjustment strategy. You know, getting into an options trade is like getting into a war. It's easy to get in. You don't always know how to get out. Uh, and if you don't know how to get out, you're going to have sleepless nights. You're going to worry about your positions. You're going to worry about losing capital. And that's just not the way we want you to learn how to trade. Knowledge of how to properly manage a position is going to significantly improve your overall success. <clears throat> so the topic for today, topics for today, are how to trade credit spreads with minimal true risk. And I'm going to show you how I define that. I'm going to talk about the forgiveness factor, and I'm going to talk about how we build time into our positions and what I consider to be the appropriate amount of time and an appropriate forgiveness factor and why that's important. And I'll define that for you here in just a moment. I'm going to talk about selecting strikes and expirations when you're building a credit spread. I'm going to talk about how and when to adjust a trade. And then I'm going to be talking also about properly compounding your account for bigger account growth. The way to grow your account big is not to risk big. It's not always having a huge amount of risk out there. In my opinion, and what we teach our, our uh, students is, it's how to put a reasonable, non-threatening amount of risk out there and do that over and over and over again, recycling the same capital into future trades. And I'm going to show you uh, a way that we've designed to do that that really accelerates the account growth. So let's start with what the forgiveness factor is. I'm going to give you a couple of definitions here, and then I'm going to take you through the structure of three different credit spread trades, all with a little bit different twist to them. So what is a forgiveness factor? 
Well, this is when the price of the position moves against your position. Price of the stock or index that you're trading moves against your position. You had a view based on a chart or some other factor that said that the uh, price of the equity was going down. You get into the position to take advantage of that declining bias and what ends up happening is the price moves higher and moves against you. If you build a forgiveness factor into the trade, that stock or index can move against you and you still might have a profit or break even on that position. Forgiveness factor is about placing natural barriers between the current price of the stock or index and the risk point on your trade. I want to make this all clear to you as we start getting into describing a couple of our positions. Forgiveness factor is just a really basically about being wrong on the direction or possibly not wrong on the direction but premature on the timing of that move and still having an opportunity to win on that trade. So let's start with an example of a credit spread trade. Um, I'm using, in, in my examples, I'm using indexes. NDX is the NASDAQ 100 index. It's not the, the ETF that tracks the performance of the NASDAQ 100. It's the index itself, NASDAQ 100. And you're going to see me use uh, S&P 500 and the Russell 2000. And uh, I'll explain to you a little bit more later why I prefer the indexes. But I'll just tell you right now that 95% of the trading we do with our subscribers and in our live trading room is all done on those three major indexes, NDX, SPX, which is the S&P 500, and RUT, which is the Russell 2000. So here's an example of a credit spread trade on NDX. NDX was trading at 45.30 during May week one. Okay, during the first week, first expiration period of May, it's trading at 45.30. We looked at the chart and felt that it had a declining bias to it, and we wanted to take advantage of that, so we opened a May week three credit spread. We sold to open a 45.95 call, and we bought to open a May week three 4600 call. All right, so we sold to open a strike that is closer to the current price of the index, and we bought to open a strike that is five points further out. Now, a couple things about the basic structure of a credit spread. The risk on your trade, the gross risk on your trade, the amount that you're willing to put into the market, is the difference between your strikes. So I have a five-point uh, spread here between my strikes, which means I have a $5 risk on the trade. Now I take that $5 times the number of shares that are represented by the contracts I'm trading. So if I was trading two contracts with each contract representing 100 shares, I would have 200 shares of risk represented here, and at $5 I, have, I would have a $1,000 risk on this trade. We went out to May week three because when we are structuring credit spreads, we don't generally want to trade the near week. We don't want to trade May week one. That starts to feel a little bit too, uh, like too much pressure, creates anxiety for us. We want to give the market some time to cycle and some time to give us a profit. And if it doesn't work out and we need to manage or adjust the trade, we want time to be able to adjust. <clears throat> so generally, we are going to go out two to, to four weeks, two to four weeks from today, and select our expiration that way. Now, how did we select our strikes? We're going to uh, show you a chart here in just a minute, and I'm going to show you the factors that we use uh, to select those strikes. But essentially, we sold to open the 45.95, and I'll show you how we chose that. That ends up becoming our risk point. We want the index to remain below 45.95, and we bought to open our 4,600. When we constructed this trade, we took a credit of $1.60 because the option that we are selling is worth more than the option we are buying, so it creates a credit that we take into our account. We have five points of gross risk on this trade, 
we just took a credit of $1.60. And so what that means is that the five of gross risk minus the credit that we take in, which is cash into our account of $1.60, leaves us with a net risk of $3.40 on this trade. So this trade is set up to benefit from a move down, but it also has a forgiveness factor built in if instead NDX moves higher. And that forgiveness factor is 65 points. The index was trading at 45.30 when we opened the trade. The index can actually move up 65 points and we would still have a profitable trade if we held this trade all the way to expiration. This $1.60 of credit that we took is all time value and it is going to decay away between now and expiration. So even if the index moved up 50 points and was trading at 45.80, our risk point is still 15 points out of the money, which means that, that, that uh, the value of the spread is decaying away. So we built a 65 point forgiveness factor into this trade and now we just have to wait for the market to tell us when is the right opportunity to close the trade. Now the factors that we considered in choosing this trade, I'm going to tell you what they are and then I'm going to show you a chart so you have a very clear visual of exactly what we were looking at when we decided to open this trade. So the factors we considered in choosing this trade were number one, NDX the highest price NDX has traded at in the last 15 years, in fact, the all-time high, with the exception of March of 2000, was 45.62.33. 45.62.33. We placed our risk point 33 points higher than the highest high. The all-time the all high, with the exception of one month, but definitely above the highest high in the last 15 years. Okay? Now, that doesn't guarantee us anything. That doesn't guarantee that the index won't move higher. But, you know, when you start getting into those lofty ranges of higher highs, there are frequently uh, short-term uh, profit takings and short-term retracements. And those are the short-term moves that we want to take advantage of. We also use Bollinger Bands, which you're going to see on the chart. Bollinger Bands and support and resistance are really the two main factors we use, not a lot of other technical charting. Remember, one of our objectives here is to keep this as simple as possible, not tons of technical indicators out there. There are a lot of great technical indicators out there, and if you really get good at um, charting and at trading and you want to add some other technical indicators to just expand your knowledge and your awareness, that's fine. But it's not a place to start. You don't want to dive in and learn all the technical indicators before you ever start earning. Learn the very basics and see how simple it can be. We use two and three standard deviation Bollinger Bands and this risk point was above our three standard deviation Bollinger Band. Now in our experience, if the price moves outside of the two or three standard Bollinger Band, it will typically reverse and move back in the other direction. Not always immediately, but it will typically act as some sort of a level of resistance. Our risk point was placed 15 points higher than that 45.80 three standard deviation Bollinger Band. Plus, we also had two levels of natural resistance between our current price and our risk strike, and we had three weeks, this says three, we actually had two and a half weeks to expiration, which allowed plenty of time to adjust the trade if necessary. So here's just a simple shot of the chart that we were looking at when we decided to place this trade. The new high on 427, we were outside of that. Our risk point was outside of that. So the horizontal line right here represents where our risk was at 45.95. Here are the Bollinger Bands. Both the two and three standard deviation Bollinger Bands are below our risk point. We would need to move above. The price would need to move above both of those. And what's so cool about the Bollinger Bands and why it's a very, very simple way to start with technical charting is because it kind of acts as a uh, pinball machine, bouncing back and forth between the Bollinger Bands. The price of the indexes move back and forth. And periodically, it will exceed one of the Bollinger Bands 
and when it does that, I refer to that as a Bollinger Band snap, it will generally snap back inside the envelope. So when we see a situation where we can place our risk point outside the Bollinger Bands, I know that if the price, in fact, moved above the three standard deviation Bollinger Band, we're beginning to increase the likelihood that it's going to reverse and move back lower again. And then we have our natural uh, line of resistance, which, which is just identifying a series of lower highs and lower lows, and in this case, we would have to move outside that line of resistance, both Bollinger Bands, and then one other long-term line of resistance in order to get to our risk point. So you can take a look at this chart, and when you start getting really familiar with it, you're going to find that this is pretty easy to identify. You literally can trade in 15 to 20 minutes a day, and I'm going to show you exactly why I believe that's true. So this trade uses time and a forgiveness factor. It's uh, relatively simple to identify um, where to place your strikes. And a credit spread is a very simple trade to set up on any trading platform. Um, once we have the trade opened, again, along uh, aligned with our desire to be uh, simplistic in our trading, once the trade is opened, we automate the close of the trade. We're going to set what's called a good till canceled order to close the trade at some point in the future for a profit. If we opened the trade for a credit of $1.60, then I'm most likely going to place a good till canceled order to close the, tr the trade for a debit of $0.80. Cents. I'm going to be willing to give back $0.80 cents of the $1.60 of credit that I took in just so I can close out of the trade take all of the risk off, and lock in an $0.80 cent profit. If you can do that over and over and over again, what you're doing is you're recycling the same capital from trade to trade to trade, and all of a sudden your profits grow exponentially against that same um, bit of capital. If you allocate just 15 to 30 minutes a day to your trading, there are two things basically that you're going to do. You're going to review your charts and look for possible new trades, and you're going to do a thorough review of your current existing positions. And here in just a minute, I'm going to give you the three basic questions you should ask yourself every day to make it very clear when evaluating your position whether or not you need to open or whether or not you need to modify or adjust that trade or whether the best course of action is no action at all. So here's the second trade I want to talk with you about. A credit spread can also be used to create a non-directional position. That non-directional variation of the credit spread is called an iron condor. It's when you open both a call credit spread and a put credit spread simultaneously. Now, the call credit spread would be opened assuming that the index is going down, and a put credit spread would be opened because that you are assuming that the index is going up. And when constructed properly, you don't really care which direction the index moves. It's going to move up and it's going to move down at some point, but you don't really care which direction it goes. It pretty much eliminates the need to assess the directional bias of the, um, the index. You're going to receive a profit. You're going to be able to take a profit um, on one side of the index or the other, one side of your position, because a movement is going to give you a profit either on the call side or the put side. And the other side is going to benefit from the forgiveness factor. And that's what makes these iron condors so, so cool. You can construct them, and if they're constructed properly, the index can move up strongly. You'll have a profit on the put spread, but as long as it was still within the boundaries of our forgiveness factor on the call spread, you can still have a profit on the call spread. So that's what makes the iron condor such a, a cool strategy. So we set up iron condors using Bollinger Bands and support, as re, support and resistance as our guidelines. I'll show you a position here in a minute, and I'm going to show you a chart. As I mentioned before, we limit our trading to about 95 percent of our trading is limited to NDX, SPX, and RUT. Now let me give you a couple of reasons why. 
Okay, I get a lot of questions about, hey, you know, can I trade these on stocks? Why aren't you using uh, uh, ETFs? All those questions, you can put those to rest. I'm just going to tell you exactly why we use these, and then it boils down to partly just trader preference. And if there's something else you want to trade, the, the strategies that I'm talking about will work just as well on others. But we trade these indexes for a couple of basic reasons. One is they work and they are very profitable. We've been trading them for years. The second reason is, and a little bit more specific, periodically we find ourselves in the money on one of our positions, meaning that maybe we didn't allow enough of a forgiveness factor and the index moved strongly against our position. One of the fears and anxieties that a lot of traders have who trade credit spreads is when your position is in the money, you are at risk of being assigned. A risk of assignment, uh, unless you completely understand it and you can just think about it without emotion and fear, a risk of assignment can be, um, you know, it can be a numbing thing for you. It's just something that you don't want to have to deal with, you're afraid, and you start making decisions on your position that really aren't in the best interest of your position. So here's why I trade the indexes. NDX, SPX, and RUT are European-style expiration options. Most all stocks and ETFs are American-style expiration. Now what that means is that American style expiration allows you to be exercised or assigned at any time prior to expiration. So if your position is in the money and it's a stock, then you are at risk of being assigned, even if your expiration is quite a ways out. I've seen early assignments that just surprise a trader and catch them off guard. But European style expiration, which the indexes are, can only be exercised or assigned at expiration. So it, it, let's just hypothetically say I'm holding a trade that expires in two weeks and it's on NDX and I'm finding that I didn't allow enough of a forgiveness factor and uh, now my trade is in the money. I don't have to immediately take action because I'm not fearful that I'm going to be assigned. I've got another two weeks before that can happen. So I can take a wait-and-see approach to see whether or not the index is actually going to reverse and move back favorably for me or whether or not I need to take management action and adjust the trade. That one component is a big deal when it comes to simplifying your trading and giving yourself a maximum amount of opportunity to um, re uh, respond to what the market is doing versus react to what the market is doing. Oftentimes, traders react out of fear and panic and a lack of understanding. Responding is all about evaluating the situation and making the best informed decision. So we love NDX, SPX, and RUT. And another very basic reason that we trade them is if you're trying to spread all of your trades out all, uh, over the entire uh, universe of optionable stocks, um, you're just not going to have the same degree of success, in my opinion, as you will if you isolate your trading to a basket of stocks, a few basic stocks, because those are the ones you're going to become very familiar with, or in our case, three indexes that we become very familiar with and we trade over and over and over again. Now, when you're opening an iron condor, you can open both sides at the same time or you can do what we call leg into the iron condor where you might open a call spread, the index moves lower, not enough for you to take a profit on the call spread, but allowing you to then open a put spread and then you have legged into the iron condor, opening each side of it at different times. Iron condors are an excellent way to grab profits regardless of the movement of the index. So let me walk you through an example on um, an iron condor, opening an iron condor. We opened this iron condor on RUT. When RUT, we started this whole sequence of trades when RUT was trading at around 1260. On the 8th of April, we sold to open a 1280, 1285 April week four call spread. 
Okay, we started with a call spread. Now we had two and a half weeks to expiration and we had a 20 point forgiveness factor. So we were 20 points out of the money. We sold for a credit of $1.40. Now our risk at that time, our net risk was $3.60. The next day on the 9th of April, we closed that call spread and we paid back 80 cents. Now what that did for us is we kept the 60 cents of profit and 60 cents of profit if you divide that by your $5 of gross risk is a 12% return. So we were into that trade and out of that trade for 12% return in one day. On that same day, April 9th, we opened a put spread. Now the index had moved down 10 points and it gave us an opportunity to close the call spread for a profit and immediately take that same capital and we recycled it into a put spread. The index was now trading at 1250 and we opened a 1230, 1225 April week four put spread. We had two and a half weeks to expiration and we were about 20 points out of the money so we had a 20 point forgiveness factor. We took a credit of $1.12. Later that same day on April 9th, the index moved back higher, and this is what I love about the indexes, is they cycle up and they cycle down, and oftentimes there are some pretty decent cycles all within the same day. The index cycled back higher, and we reopened the 1280-1285 call spread, and we took a credit of $1.30. So we were in at $1.40 yesterday, closed for $0.80, cents, and now we're back in for $1.30. So... Now, at this point, we hold an iron condor. And remember I talked to you about the five point of spread risk that you have to um, have available? That's your risk. Your broker is going to require you to have that five points of spread risk available in your account. We're not trading on margin, but you have to have enough cash in your account in order to trade that. But when you add the other side of an iron condor, there's generally no requirement. Now this may vary by broker, but with the broker that I use, there's generally no requirement that you have to have an additional $5 of spread risk. And the reason is because you cannot possibly lose on both sides of this trade at the same time. So you actually are adding the credit, but not adding another $5. So we started with $1.12 of credit on five points of risk, now we have $2.42 of credit against five points of risk. That starts to increase your leverage and that's how you're going to start to increase the size of your account. On the 10th of April, we closed the put spreads. The market cycled up, this was the next day. Market cycled up, we gave back 60 cents of the $1.12 we originally took. And then we waited another week on April 17th and we closed out the 1280-85 calls. So 40 cents of um, uh, debit, that's what we gave back, okay? Now let me show you what the summary of this trade was. We were in the trade for seven trading days, nine calendar days. We were trading five contracts on this trade. Now we had five contracts in multiple accounts, so we had five contracts in each of multiple accounts but we ended up with a net profit of $2.02. That's $2.02 of profit against five points of spread risk. Now, some of you might refer to that as margin. It's technically not margin because you're using cash that you have in your account. Technically, margin is where you're borrowing funds and extending uh, the use of uh, capital beyond what you actually have in your account. But this is five points of risk, $2.02 .02 of profit. This was a 40.4% return for the nine calendar days that we were in the trade. That's actually 40% on our maximum gross risk on the trade. All we're doing is we're opening and closing the trade on cycles, okay? And then what you do is you recycle capital for bigger returns on the same capital. Here's a chart to show you exactly what took place. 
So here we sold to open the original call spread, and you can see we were trading right around the upper Bollinger Bands. That's a good place for us to, to open. Here the next day we bought to close the call spread, and we sold to open the put spread. And you can see here that this was perfect timing because we had a, had a Bollinger Band snap pattern, which was telling us there was a high likelihood that we were going to move back higher off of that price point. That's a good time to take a profit and a good time to open the put spread. Here we had moved higher and we sold to open the second call spread. Now in hindsight, I think we might have been a little premature getting back into that call because we were in the middle of the Bollinger Bands, but I remember we opened it because we were able to reopen that call spread for only 10 cents less than what we had opened it for originally. The next day we continued to trend higher uh, we bought to close the put spread for our profit, and then you can see that the index bounced back and forth between the Bollinger Bands until uh, we had uh, on the 17th a sell-off, and we bought to close the call spread, and we were out of everything. So a simple Bollinger Band view of the chart can allow you to get in and out of these trades just by trading it like a pinball, bouncing back and forth between the upper and lower Bollinger Bands. But now let's talk about managing a position, okay? Because sometimes even when a forgiveness factor is built in, a position is going to need adjustment. And again, we're trying to simplify our trading to a point where I build in a forgiveness. Well, let me start with this. I'm going to use three indexes. It simplifies my trading. I don't worry about exercise or assignment and I can focus on just three uh, equities to pay attention to and look at the chart. Second thing is, I'm going to always build a forgiveness factor into my trade. And third thing is, I'm going to always build two to four weeks of time into my trade. Beyond that, if I know with confidence that I can manage or adjust a trade, if I get into trouble, now I've completely simplified my trading and I get it down to a point where I have little or no anxiety about the trade. There are three simple ways to adjust a credit spread. You either roll it out, which is essentially adding more time to the position. You're going to move the expiration out in order to add time to the trade. Or you reposition it, which is essentially adjusting the strikes so that you now are out of the money instead of in the money. Or you do both. Almost all of the adjustments that we make are one of these three, either the rollout, or the reposition, or doing both. When we do these repositions, rollouts, or both, it only requires a small amount of capital, typically, to manage. So this isn't something where you have to have a huge amount of capital sit off to the side in order to manage these trades. We generally are managing with a small amount of additional capital committed to the trade, and the whole purpose for management is to nurture the trade along to a profitable or minimally break-even closure. There are going to be trades that we're going to lose on. There are going to be some trades that we're going to just have to record as a loss. That's just the reality of trading, and that's okay because this is a business. Your profits are your income, and your losses are your expenses. And if your week-to-week -week, um, results from your business are showing a positive gain, then it doesn't really matter how many you won and how many you lost. All that matters is how you finished at the end of the week or at the end of the month. Now, I said before I was going to give you a very simple decision process to know whether or not you should be managing a trade. So I want to go through this, and then I want to go through one example of a trade. So for each position, what I would suggest is that you look at it every day and ask yourself the following three questions. Is there a profit in the trade that I could take? If the answer is no, move on to question two. Is, there, is the risk strike in the money? That means the strike, the leg on the spread that you sold to open, the one that was closest to the money when you opened it. If the answer is no, move on to question three. Is the expiration of your spread a, less than a week away? If the answer is no, you're done. There's nothing else that you want to do on that trade. If it's still out of the money and there's no profit to take and you still have more than a week to expiration, there's no reason for you to spend any more time on that trade. But now let's go back. If you have a profit, 
if you do have a profit, you have to decide, is it enough of a profit for you to take? Okay, and that's rather ambiguous. We try to guide people into things to think about. I won't get into all those here today, but um, some of that's just dependent on you as an individual trader. Do you want to go ahead and take the profit or not? Part of our decision process is based on the chart, and if we see any indications that are showing that the directional bias is shifting, then we'll take the profit no matter how small it is. If the answer to question number two is yes, that your risk point is in the money, this position may require a reposition or a rollout. And if the answer to question number three is yes, you are less than one week away, then the position may require a reposition or a rollout, most likely a rollout. If the answer to question two and three are both yes, then that is the, the dinging the bell and saying it's time to manage this trade. See, once you learn this, it's so simplistic, it's so simple, you can allocate 15 to 30 minutes a day. And by the way, in the services that we provide, I do this exact process for you every day on every position that we hold. I do a recorded video that's 15 to 30 minutes long that I send to you and I go through this question process on every position every day and explain to you why I am choosing what I am choosing to do or not do. All right, let's talk about our example and then I want to take uh, some questions. Um, so this is all about leveraging the cycles. I'm using NDX again. At the time that we opened this trade, NDX was trading at 43.80, and we decided to open an iron condor. We did not leg into this iron condor. We opened both sides of it at the same time. Index is trading at 43.80 on March 30th, and we opened a 44, 45, 44, 50, April week three call spread. Simultaneously, we opened a 4300, 4295 April week three put spread. So here you go. These are the credits that we took, the combined credits. Got good credits on that, um, and, and uh, that's all against a five point spread risk. We have two and a half weeks to expiration. Uh, we're 65 points out of the money, so a 65-point forgiveness factor on the calls and an 80-point forgiveness factor on the puts. At this point in time, I don't care which direction NDX moves because I'm going to win on one side on the move, and I have the forgiveness factor working for me on the other side. On the 2nd of April, we closed the call spreads. I paid back 65 cents in order to close that spread, so I've got a dollar one of profit. On the 6th of April, we, clo we reopened the call spread. I'm sorry. On the 6th of April, we, re we opened a new call spread because the market had moved back higher. But it was a different set of strikes using the same expiration. So we're right back into an iron condor, but our iron condor is now a 43 100, 4295, and a 4400, 4405. We took a dollar 50 of credit on that call spread when we opened it. Now on the 9th of April, the market had continued to go higher, and we closed our put spread, and we gave back 50 cents in order to close and lock in a profit of 67 cents. Now what happened is on the 10th of April, we did our three-question process. And we realized that our 4,400 call strike that we had just opened was in the money. And we made a decision that it was time to manage it. We were starting to run out of time. We were starting to run up against April week three expiration. We very simply, our view of the chart was that it was just a matter of time that the index would move back lower again. And we just wanted to add more time to the position. So we closed the 4400, 4405 week three April spread and paid $3.40 to close that. And simultaneously, all in one trading transaction, we sold to open the May week three, 4400, 4405. This was simply a matter of using the same strikes and extending the expiration of the trade out one month. 
four additional weeks. That just gave us a lot of time to wait for this trade to be successful. We took in a credit of $3.20 on the May position when we opened it. So we paid $3.40 at the same time taking a credit of $3.20. So this management, the cost of this adjustment was $0.20. Cents. We paid $3.40, we received $3.20, so it cost us $0.20 cents to adjust this trade. That's minimal. That is just nothing, really, that we are uh, having to pay. And then on the 17th, a week later, we were actually offered an opportunity by the market to close the May position for $2.20. The rollout allowed us to hold and wait for a down cycle. If we had held on to the May or to the April week three, we ran right up against April week three expiration. That would not have been a comfortable uh, situation. And so by having an extra four weeks built into the trade, it gave us the luxury of just saying, let's wait until the cycle works in our favor. We were in this trade for 14 days, 18 calendar days, 14 trading days, 18 calendar days. We ended up taking an overall profit of $468. Now we gave back some of the prior profits we had taken in this trade in the sequence of uh, managing this position, uh, but we ended up locking in 78 cents of profit on the six contracts that we held in this trade. So despite the fact that we ended up having to manage, despite the fact that we had to give back uh, 20 cents um, and um, uh, reduce our uh, uh, the original profit we had on the trade, we ended up closing out back to cash and we have a 15.5% return on our five-point spread. We'd rather manage than worry and understanding adjustments buys a lot of peace of mind. And here's the chart. Here's where we opened the iron condor. You can see the Bollinger Bands here. Um, here's where we uh, found ourselves in the money on the put spread, but it was a Bollinger Band snap, so we took no action and instead waited for the bounce. Um, here's where we opened the new call spread, and this was when we decided it was time to roll out, and then we exited over here. So if you leverage the cycles based on Bollinger Bands, it's a great approach for newer traders. It keeps things pretty simple. You build a forgiveness factor into each trade. It helps you be wrong but potentially profitable. And you give your position time so that you avoid that roller coaster fear and anxiety that so many uh, traders work with. This is really how simple trading can actually be. All right, so I want to share just two minutes here about uh, the program which would allow you to participate in um, letting us guide you through this type of trading. Um, it's called the Profit Builder Program. We'd like to help you learn. We'd love to help you simplify and enjoy your trading while growing your account. So we're offering a chance to participate in a program that we started based on our live trading room trades. Now this is not participation in our live trading room. This is we place trades in our live trading room and then what we do is we grab some of those trades and we send them out as alerts to people who are part of our Profit Builder program. We recommend that people initially start with $5,000 of trading capital. Now this is not saying that you should have a $5,000 account. This is saying that we generally will start with an allocation of $5,000 towards risk in the trades that we place. And typically we're going to have two to four trades uh, open at one time. The balance of whatever capital you have in your account is reserved for adjustments. So if you had a $10,000 account, for example, we may start with an allocation of as much as $5,000 and the balance of that is available for adjustments. Then what we're going to do, and this is all about how to properly compound your account and grow a bigger account, we're going to compound your profits each week into new positions. So if in the first week of your trading you made $600, the next week, we are willing to risk $5,600, the original $5,000 plus the profits of $600. If in the week two, you made $300, then in the third week, we're willing to risk the $5,000 plus the $600 plus the $300 of profits, 
So our targeted risk would be 5,900. We're going to continue to do that for one quarter. And this is what we've been building to uh, this quarter. At the beginning of the next quarter, we're going to reset to $5,000 plus some portion of the profits from the prior quarter. And how much of that will depend on what the profits actually are during the quarter. So let's just say, for example, we made uh, $10,000 for the quarter. We may take 3000 of that and add it to our original 5000 and start the second quarter with a capital risk of 8000 So what we're doing is we're essentially compounding throughout the quarter, and then we reset at the beginning of the new quarter so that we have some portion of our profits that are set aside in cash and other another portion of it that is helping us exponentially increase the size of our account. Our current run rate across the accounts that we are trading this in, we've got multiple accounts that we're doing this in, our current run rate is averaging 12% return per week. I can't guarantee that that's going to continue. And we all know as traders that what has happened doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to continue. But that is our current average. Projected profits for this particular quarter right now, and this is based on today's uh, projection as of close, is 22856 and the projected profits for the next 12 months, making assumptions based on the current run rate, making assumptions based on what we would start each uh, future quarter at, projected profits are 14392 143,922. We're trying to keep this very simple, but create a powerful way to start small and grow big. And uh, we've got a lot of people that follow along with our trades and uh, are making money and enjoying the program. And the kind of comments that I'm getting from people are that they've, they've never felt so at ease with their trading and they feel as though that they finally understand exactly what they're doing. All right. So, Here's the offer, and then I'm going to take um, uh, take questions. If this interests you, and it's not the right for, uh, program for everybody, but if this does interest you, you can sign up now. Uh, what you receive with the Profit Builder program is a six-month subscription to our Profit Builder alerts. What we're going to do is send you email or text alerts uh, every time we open, close, or manage a trade that's part of the Profit Builder program. Uh, these Profit Builder trades are being uh, opened and closed in our live trading room, and we let you know that this is a trade that we are um, uh, opening in the Profit Builder program. We tell you the strikes. We tell you the expirations. We tell you the number of contracts to trade so that you're in sync with us in terms of growing your account. I do a daily 15 to 30-minute video, which is an analysis of charts, an analysis of the current positions, an in-depth analysis, helping you learn. So the whole purpose of the videos are five days a week for the next six months. You basically get your entire options trading education, teaching you how to learn, teaching you how to trade, teaching you how to think like a trader, earning some money as you go, but you're not trying to absorb it all from a, a large book or a two-day seminar that then you have to go figure out how to implement. I'm going to give you this education in snippets, in 15 to 30-minute snippets, five days a week for the next six months. And this is your opportunity to compound your account each quarter. Now, the regular price of this program is $12.95. Uh, there actually should be a line through that $12.95 because uh, today, I'm offering this at $5.95 for the people who have attended this webinar. So it's not $12.95, that's the regular price, but for the next 24 hours, I'm offering it available to you for $595. So that's just a little under $100 a month for the next six months. After that, if you renew, if you decide you want to continue, uh, the price is grandfathered at $5.95, so you get to renew again and have a full year at uh, less than what the, uh, the retail price is. So if you're interested, you can sign up at optionsmoneymaker.com forward slash builder, optionsmoneymaker.com forward slash builder. And if you have other questions for me that perhaps we don't get to today, feel free to email me directly, Mark 
D, Mark D at optionsmoneymaker.com. Mark D at optionsmoneymaker.com. All right, so I'm going to leave that on the screen. I'm going to scroll through some questions and just see if I can um, spot some questions that perhaps have not already been uh, answered. Okay, let's see. Uh, which trading software are you using? I do all of my personal trading at Options House, which is the old Trade Monster platform, trading platform. Trade Monster and Options House merge together here. So it's under the uh, name of Options House now, but it's a very simple trading platform to use. Very easy to ex execute these trades. Uh, great fills, and um, it's just uh, very, you know, one aspect of simplicity. Um, when you close a trade, are you opening another within a week or are you waiting another 30 days? Oh no, when I close a trade, I'm looking to open a new trade maybe that same day. Uh, I'm not waiting a week, I'm not waiting 30 days. Uh, I'm opening my trades two to, th to four weeks out. So if the trade I just closed, um, I opened a week ago, I might be opening a new trade that has a different expiration and different strikes. Today, the market sold off, had a nice sell-off to it. We made a bunch of money today because we were in a bunch of call credit spreads and we were in some iron condors where we closed the call side of the iron condor. Um, we actually turned around and deployed some of that capital into some new put spreads um, because we were able to go way out of the money on those put spreads and we see some level of resistance uh, building. Uh, what's the typical credit for your condors? Uh, typically on condors, we're going to be somewhere around 250 uh, plus or minus, you know, as much as uh, pro probably 225 to 275 is a typical range for our, our iron condors. Um, let's see here. Uh, we talked about uh, return. Someone's asking about return on margin. We don't... The, the, we don't need to talk about margin. Talking about cash in your account, you're talking about the commitment of $5 of risk to that spread. Uh, yes, uh, there's a comment here, it's less commissions. Commissions just won't, really don't matter that much when you're building this kind of, of uh, profit and return. Um, for a five point spread on RUT, what does your broker require in capital? Five points. They require $5. If you trade a five contract trade on RUT and you have a five point difference between the leg that you sold and the leg that you bought, you need five dollars times five contracts times a hundred shares. Five contracts represents five hundred shares. So that would be twenty five hundred dollars of cash that you need to have in your account in order to make that trade. Uh, if you're going to trade, spend 30 minutes a day, is it more optimal to trade at the open or closer to the close? Helen, it doesn't really matter, in my opinion. Now, there are a lot of theories about you, know, you should do all of your trading at the beginning or at the end of the market, and I agree that there is a heightened level of uh, volatility and activity uh, during those time periods, but frankly, if you're doing, the, you're doing these types of trades, these are not the types of trades where you have to frantically get in or get out, or, or if you uh, miss it in this moment, then you've completely lost the opportunity. I'd say you fit it into your schedule, you do your complete uh, position review every day, look for your opportunities when you have time to fit it into your schedule, and that's one of the things I like about it. It's a little bit more casual trading. Hey, I love to trade, and I trade every day, but part of my lifestyle freedom is I don't want to be confined. I like to go out for a run on the beach. I like to go out for a motorcycle ride, and I'm going to take my time away from the market, and I know that those opportunities will exist um, anytime I'm looking for them. Uh, are you typically selling in the money strikes when you roll out in time? No, not always. Sometimes we're rolling out and we're still out of the money, but sometimes if we're deep in the money, we've gotten way behind on a trade, we will both do a rollout and a reposition so that we adjust our strikes to being at or out of the money. Uh, do you normally roll out to the four-week ahead cycle? It's going to depend, Helen, on whether or not... Uh, it, it's, it's really going to depend on the cost of the rollout and our view of the chart and how much time we think we need to build in. Certainly, if I can build more time in for the same 
uh, cost of management, I'm going to do that. Because I'm not intending necessarily to hold the position that long. I just want to have enough time to be in complete control of whatever decision I make. Um, I'm not sure how you're calculating that AS. Isn't that about a 1.5% return when you compare the profit and the amount of capital required? Uh, no, you're, you're comparing the uh, profit per share to the risk per share. The risk per share is $5. The profit per share is whatever I used in the example. And uh, that's how you calculate that. If you open positions today with calls 65 points out of the money and puts 80 points out of the money, there is so little premium. That's just not true. You just have to look at your expirations. I opened an iron condor about 15 minutes before the market closed today on uh, NDX. I went out to uh, June week four and I opened an iron condor and uh, I filled that iron condor at a uh, credit of $2.90. So $2.90 on a five-point spread risk. How difficult is it to fill a four-legged trade? I don't have any difficulty at all uh, trading at um, Option House. So we like to trade them in four trade uh, positions. Just a couple more questions, and then uh, I'm going to uh, close out here. Uh, when you open positions and choose option strikes, uh, what are the typical deltas of the short strikes? On credit spreads, I don't pay attention to deltas. We have other services. We have more advanced services, our uh, trade to win uh, education uh, package. Uh, we trade and teach uh, calendar spreads, diagonal spreads, uh, what we call market tamers, which is a double calendar. We trade combos. Uh, and those deltas are important to us, but credit spreads, we don't pay attention to deltas on that. And I'm going to take two more questions. One is a great question. Uh, do you take volatility into account and how? Well, so here's the beautiful thing about volatility. Uh, they're easy to understand volatility on uh, NDX and um, uh, SPX and RUT because there are actual charts for those volatility levels. And the way I take them into account is if we have extremely high volatility, then we love trading credit spreads and uh, iron condors. If we have extremely low volatility, then we may be trading a different strategy, but typically you're going to still be able to trade the credit spreads. The biggest impact is your strikes are going to actually be closer to the money when you have lower volatility because the premium is less. All right, one last question. Um, will we get a recording of today's webinar? Yes, you will, but that's not the last question I'm going I'm to take. Uh, this is the last question. For NDX, depending on expiration week, there may only be 25-point spreads. Yes, uh, we'll trade those, but typically I avoid those weeks. And as we get closer to those weeks, they're going to fill in uh, the strikes, and uh, they'll come down to either five or ten point spreads. Uh, but like today, I went out to July week one, and there were only twenty five point spreads. When I backed up to June week four, I was able to trade uh, five and ten point spreads. So um, let me just close out here by saying thank you very much for spending some time with me today. I sincerely appreciate it. I know your time is valuable, but I, I hope I've given you a little bit to think about as a trader in a way that you could perhaps increase your level of success, either as a new trader getting started or as an experienced trader and you'd like a greater degree of success. Again, the Profit Builder Program, it, I've tried to price this so it makes it very easy for people to make a decision to say, yeah, I want to really learn how to do this. I'm going to give you five days a week for six months, education content that I think is second to none. I think you're going to learn a lot along the way, and I am extremely repetitive from day to day so that you absorb and learn. One basic thing about adult learning is, on an average, adults typically have to hear the same thing about seven times. Now, that doesn't insult anybody. It's just 
the way adults learn. I used to run a learning organization as part of my role in uh, my corporate job, and I'm very aware of how people need to learn, and I try to structure my education that way. At the end of six months, I want you to have made money, but more importantly, I want you to have learned how to be a trader and how to think like a trader and feel as though this is something you can do for the rest of your life. Optionsmoneymaker.com forward slash builder will get you registered. Only for the next 24 hours, it's $595. After that, it's $1,295. Questions for me that we might not have gotten to today, Mark D at optionsmoneymaker.com. Jesse, thank you so much for hosting. Uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. That's it.